Okay, welcome back. Uh, I thought what I would do um, is to review a few of the things that we've just talked about um, from Chapter 1, Parts 1 and 2. So I've developed a little worksheet for us here to look at. Uh, we're going to do some of it right now, and then the rest of it you'll be expected to do either at home or, or in class, um, helping us to maybe familiarize ourself, uh, ourselves with with these vocabulary terms that we've been throwing around. So the first thing I want to do is I've listed some properties on this first page here um, and I want to identify those properties as being either chemical or physical properties. Now remember if it's a chemical property um, that relates to a substance's ability to undergo changes that transform it into a different substance. And if it's a physical property, um, it's a characteristic that can be observed without changing the identity of the substance. So, for instance, let's say I say something has a blue color to it. Do I change that substance chemically by determining the fact that it's blue? Or, when I'm finished with it, is it still the same after I've determined that it's blue? Um, I claim that determining color is a physical property. So on my worksheet here, I'll put a P for physical. So once again, that's a characteristic that I can observe about the substance without changing the identity. So a crayon is blue. Well, it's still a crayon when I'm finished with it. I haven't changed it. So it's a physical property. How about melting point? Think about that for a minute. Do I have to change the substance chemically to determine its melting point? Or, after I've determined the melting point, is it still the same chemically? For instance, water has a melting point of zero Celsius. Well, I've determined that. When I'm finished, is it still water or is it something different? Well, of course, it's still water, isn't it? So that would be another physical property. Now, density. Um, let's talk a little bit about density. Density is the mass per unit volume of a substance. So we find the mass of the substance and we divide it by the volume of that substance, usually in milliliters, and we have a uh, property called density. So if I say the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter, after I've determined that density, is it still water? or have I changed its identity? Well, it's still water, isn't it? So that would be another physical property. So we have three physical properties to begin. Let's take a look at number four. How about saying something reacts with water? If I take a piece of sodium metal, which we'll demonstrate in class, and put that in a beaker of water, it reacts violently with the water. It gives off heat, it gives off hydrogen gas, and we end up making some hydroxide and sodium ions. Now think about this. Determining the fact that sodium reacts with water, is it still sodium in water, or have I changed its identity? Well, I've changed it, haven't I? I've made hydrogen gas, I've made sodium ions, I've made hydroxide ions. That is a chemical property of sodium. Let me do one more for you. I don't want to do too many. I want you guys to have the opportunity to have your own little fun here. How about flammability? So gasoline is flammable. After I determine the fact that gasoline is flammable, is it still gasoline or have I changed its identity? Well, it's now carbon dioxide and water vapor, isn't it, after I've burned gasoline? So I've changed the chemical identity. So it's not a physical property. It is a chemical property. Okay, now once again, you're going to have the opportunity to do the rest of these either in class or as a homework assignment. Okay, so there's a little bit of help on the first page. Let's take a look at the second. Let's talk about physical and chemical changes. So, if I take a look at what a physical change is, that's a change in a substance that does not change the identity of the substance. A chemical change is a change in which one or more substances are converted into different substances. Now, a couple of these are tough, so we might have to talk a little bit about these. Let's take a look at number one. 
Sodium chloride, also known as table salt, dissolves in water. Now, after I've dissolved table salt in water, do I still have table salt and water? Can I get my table salt and water back pretty easily? Let's think about this. If I evaporate off the water, won't I still have table salt on the bottom? Well, the table salt will remain the same. I won't change the table salt chemically at all. It's still sodium chloride, and I would still have water. So this would be a physical change. It's sort of a tough one. The process of dissolving is a physical change. How about milk souring? Think about that for a minute. Do I have, um, excuse me, is, there, is it a change in a substance that does not change the chemical identity of the substance? So after milk sours, do I still have what I started with chemically? Or do I have a change in which one or more substances are converted into different substances? Do I still have chemically the same thing after milk is soured? <laughs> Obviously I don't, do I? We have a chemical change here. Okay, next one, silver tarnishes. So if we expose silver to air, there's a little bit of sulfur in the air, and that causes the formation of silver sulfide, which is a very dark substance, so we call it tarnish. Now, do I still have silver metal after the tarnishing process, or have I changed it chemically? You are right, that is a chemical change. I'll bet you could do number four now on your own. How about sugar dissolving in water? Well, if salt dissolving in water is physical, sugar dissolving in water is probably a physical change also. Number five, an apple is cut. So I take an apple and I slice it up. Do I still have chemically the same thing? I've changed the apple. It's no longer nice and round, but I still have chemically what I started with. So that is a physical change. Okay, so there are the first five on this page determining chemical or physical change. And like I said, you'll have the opportunity to do the rest of these later. Let's move on to the next one. How about intensive and extensive properties? Now, if you forgot what intensive and extensive are, now would be a good time to go back in your notes and review. Or, how about if I just tell you? As you might recall, an intensive property is a property that does not depend upon the amount of matter present. An extensive property does depend upon the amount of matter present. So let's take a look at number one. The density of platinum. And we talked about what density was just a few minutes ago on another problem. Density is mass per unit volume. Does it make a difference how much platinum I have? What if I have a small cube of platinum? Will its density still be 21.4 grams per cubic centimeter? Well, what if I had a room full of platinum? Wouldn't its density still be 21.4 grams per cubic centimeter? So does it make a difference how much platinum I have? The density will still be 21.4. So we call that an intensive property. How about this? Elemental mercury is a liquid at room temperature. So, does it make a difference how much mercury I have? Could I have a drop of mercury or could I have a beaker full of mercury? So long as it's at room temperature, it will be a liquid. So it doesn't make a difference how much I have. So that is another intensive property. Number three, let's talk about the volume. Volume is the amount of space something takes up. So the volume of a liquid, I don't know, let's say water or gasoline or alcohol, is 45.4 milliliters. Does that depend upon the amount of liquid I have? Of course it does. If I have more liquid, the volume will be greater. If I have less liquid, the volume won't be as big. So this does depend upon the amount of matter that's present. So this is an extensive property. Let's do one more. The pencil has a mass of 18 grams. Doesn't that make a difference how much pencil I have? 
you have a big pencil or a small pencil, the mass would change. So this is another extensive property. Okay, let's take a look at the bottom group here. This one actually goes on to the next page. And so I want to know whether the following substances are elements, compounds, homogeneous mixtures, and if it's a homogeneous mixture, we're going to put the letter S. Do you remember why? Yeah, because another name for a homogeneous mixture is a solution. And our last option is a heterogeneous mixture. So, let's take a piece of gold foil. Let's see. Obviously, gold foil is not a mixture of anything. It's a pure substance. All we have is gold foil. So it's not going to be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Is gold an element or a compound? Yeah, it's one of our elements, isn't it? So I would put an E here by gold foil, telling us that it's an element. How about concrete? Well, obviously concrete is some type of mixture. It's not an element. It's not a pure compound. It's a mixture of many compounds, isn't it? Is it uniform throughout? Is it homogeneous? Or is it not uniform throughout? Well, obviously there's a liquid phase. There's a solid phase involved there. If I were to take a piece of concrete and hold it up, I would have large pieces and small pieces. It would be muddy, it would be wet. And then when it dries, of course, we could slice that concrete and we could see stones inside that concrete of all sorts of different sizes. It's not uniform throughout. So concrete would be a heterogeneous mixture. How about muddy water? What do you think? Is there an element called muddy water? No, it's ridiculous. Is there a compound? muddy water. No, that's ridiculous too. Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? Well, if the muddy water sits for a while, don't it have a liquid phase on top and a solid phase on the bottom? It's not uniform throughout. That's another heterogeneous mixture. Hamburger. Is there an element called hamburger? No. Is there a pure compound hamburger? Obviously not. It's a mixture of many, many different compounds. So, is it the same throughout, or is it different throughout? Well, take a look at a chunk of hamburger. Right? There's liquid parts to it. So there are some solid parts to it. There's some fat to it. There's some meat to it. Um, it's definitely not the same throughout. That would be another heterogeneous mixture. How about cologne? your Tommy Hilfiger cologne at home. Is that an element? No. Is it a compound? Nope. It's a secret recipe. Lots and lots of different compounds mixed together. Is it the same throughout? Hmm. Is it a uniform mixture? Yes, it is. So your cologne would be a solution or homogeneous mixture. Let's do one more and then I'll have you do the rest on your own. How about brass? Brass is a mixture of two or more metals. In this case, brass is copper mixed with zinc. Now, if you take a look at a piece of brass and you cut that piece of brass, it's the same throughout. It's very, very uniform. So some solutions can be solids, and brass is an example. So this is a solution or homogeneous mixture. And once again, these others you'll have to do on your own. Okay, the last thing I want to do on this worksheet is quickly identify a few elements by their name or their symbol. I'm going to give you either the name or the symbol, and you have to give me what's missing. It's a little easy practice, I hope. There's a list of about 50 or so that you're going to have to learn at the beginning of your notes. Now, keep in mind, sometimes the symbol does not match the English name. And we went over a few of those in our notes. Well, sodium is a good example. The symbol for sodium is not S, is it? The symbol for sodium comes from the Latin name natrium. It is N-A. Notice when I write the symbol for sodium, the first letter is uppercase and the second letter is lowercase. It is not N-A. That would be incorrect. That first letter A, that first letter if there are two letters in the symbol, 
must be capitalized. Let's see, here I give you the symbol F. What is the symbol F for? Do you remember? That's yeah, fluorine, isn't it? It is spelled F L U O R I N E. Fluorine. Number three, F E. Think about F E. What is that? Do you remember? Huh? F E is the element iron. I R O N. Let me do one more for you, then I expect you to be able to do the others on your own. Tungsten. Do you remember the symbol for tungsten? Yeah, it's another strange one, isn't it? It's not T, it's not T U, it's not T N. In fact, there's no T in the symbol at all. It's just the capital letter W. If there's one letter in the symbol, make sure that that letter is uppercase. All right. Well, there's your review of our first couple of video lectures. I hope this has helped. It should help you quite a bit with your homework and any of the work that you have to do in class. So I hope you enjoyed. Come in and ask questions or go back and review the videos and your notes if you need extra help. Thanks. Bye-bye.